Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this particular video, we'll be looking into measure of spread. In the previous video, we already have seen measure of central tendency. We have seen it with examples. I recommend you to watch that first and then come to this particular video. So let's see first what exactly measure of spread is. So you can see over here the measure of spread is nothing but it is a statistic measure that tells you how much the data values in a set vary or differ from each other. In simple words, it helps us to understand how much individual values differ from the central tendency like mean or median. So basically you already have seen distribution of data set in the previous video. From that particular distribution, we can plot the measures of central tendency like mean or median. So basically this measure of spread deals with the concept that how each and every particular data point is actually differing from the measure of central tendency, for example, mean or median. So if you consider mean, so from the mean position, or I would say from the mean or average element, how much values are getting differed from that particular mean, how they are varying. So that can be understood by measure of spread. Now there are four common and most important measures of spread. The first one is range. The second one is variance. The third one is standard deviation. And the fourth one is quartiles. Quartiles itself has two, three parameters. We are going to look into it. Now let's start with the very first measure of spread that is range. It's a very simple measure of spread. Let's have a look at the definition. The range is the difference between the highest and the lowest values in the data set. Now let's see what exactly it is used for. The range tells you the span or width of the data set. That means over what all values the data set is actually varying, how much it is spread. But it does not tell you how the data values are distributed within the span. It only tells you the width of the data set. It does not tell you how much data values are actually accommodating in that particular range. It does not tell you the behavior of spread present in that particular data set. So let's have a look at an example. For example, if we consider these data points 11, 24, 32, 40, 67 and 81. Now for this particular data points, if we have to calculate what is the range of this, then in that particular case, it is very simple. As the definition says, it is the difference between the highest and the lowest values in the data set. So over here in this particular data set, the highest value is 81 and the lowest value is 11. You can clearly see that. Now we just have to calculate the difference between these and we get it as 70. 81 minus 11 is nothing but 70. And that is what is the range for this particular data that is given here. So I hope you must have got a basic idea of how we can calculate the range of the data set. Now let's have a look at it in the distribution plot. Let's say we have this particular normal distribution. Let's say it starts from this particular value. It ends at this particular value. Let's say the lower value that it is having is 10 and the higher value that it is having is 90. Now in this particular case, we can see our data is distributed in this particular fashion. We can see the values are actually present in this particular fashion. Now, when we talk about range, it is nothing but highest minus lowest. 90 minus 10 is what? It is 80. Now, what range tells that each and every value, you can take any value in this particular distribution, every single value will be lying in this particular range itself. That is from 10. To 90 and also by this you can understand the width of this particular data set is nothing but 80 that is the range of the data set is 80 so i hope this particular measure of spread is clear to you all the next measure of spread is variance let's have a look at the definition of it the variance is the average of the squared differences between each data value and the mean of the data set so basically this is the way how we can calculate the variance but what exactly it is used for, let's have a look at it. The variance tells you how much data values deviate or vary from the mean position. Or I would say the value, which is nothing but the average of the entire data values present inside the data set. 
So basically, when we consider this particular value as a center point, targeting this particular value, if we compare every other value, how much they are actually differing from this particular mean value, that is nothing but variance. But it is not in the same unit as the data values. For example, if the data values are present in meters, that means the unit of the data values are in meters, then in that case, the variance value won't be in meters, it will be in square meters or meter square. So that is what is the difference that this particular thing has. Now let's have a look at the formula for calculating the variance. So basically we have two formula. The first formula comes whenever we consider the population. Now what exactly is this population? Population means the entire data set. We are not talking about one single subset from the data set. We are talking about entire data set. So we call it population. So whenever we have to calculate the variance of population, then in that particular case, we have this particular formula. The formula says we have to calculate summation of i equals to 1, 1 to capital N. It means we have to consider all the data points. Here capital N represents the total number of data points present in that particular population. We have to take the square of the difference between the each data point value and the mean of all the data points. And then we have to completely divide it by the total number of data values present inside it. Here, x bar is nothing but mean. It is nothing but average of all the data values. Similarly, whenever we have to calculate the variance of a single subset from the entire population, then in that case, we call it as sample. So whenever we have to calculate the variance of a sample, then in that case, we have this particular formula. Now over here, just remember that we do not represent the total number of data points by capital N. Here we represent it by small n. And the numerator remains the same. We have to calculate the summation of the square of difference between the each data point value and the mean. There is a slight change in the denominator and it is nothing but we have to subtract the total number of data points present inside the sample by one. That's the only difference. So I hope these two formulas are clear to you all. Now let's take a simple example of calculating the variance with respect to a particular population. So over here we have this particular population that contains the data points 5, 8, 10, 12 and 15. We have to calculate the variance for it. Now focus on this particular part. It is a population. We already know what exactly is the formula of calculating variance of a population. Let's write it. So here we have the formula summation i equals to 1 to capital N, xi minus x bar, the whole square divided by capital N again. Now over here, capital N is nothing but the total number of points. Here, the total number of points is 5. So capital N value is 5. Now we have to calculate the value of mean first. We have to take the average of all these data points. So I hope you remember how to calculate mean. It is nothing but we have to just add all these data point values that is 5 plus 8 plus 10 plus 12 plus 15 and then we have to divide it by the total number of data values present. So it is nothing but 5. Let's just calculate it here in the numerator we get 50 and in the denominator we get 5. So 50 divided by 5 is nothing but 10. So we got the mean value as 10. Now let's plug in all the values. Now we have to consider every single data value. So let's consider 5 first. So 5 minus. Now here we have to subtract it from mean. What is mean? It is 10. And then we have to take the square. Similarly, we have to consider now the next data point that is 8. 8 minus 10, the whole square. For the third data point, it is 10 minus 10, the whole square. For the fourth data point, it is 12 minus 10, the whole square. And so on for the fifth data point. Now once we did that, we have to now consider the denominator. It is nothing but the capital N value that is 5. Now let's solve the numerator. Over here we get minus 5 in the bracket and minus 5 square is nothing but 25. Similarly, 8 minus 10 is minus 2, minus 2 square is 4 plus 10 minus 10 is 0, 0 square is 0. So let's write 0. 12 minus 10 is 2. 2 square is 4 plus 15 minus 10 is 5, 5 square is 25 again. Now over here in the denominator it is 5. Now let's simply add all this and write the final numerator value. So we got 58 divided by 5. Now let's divide it. We get 
the variance value as 11.6. So this is how we have to calculate the variance. I hope it is clear. Now let's consider this particular distribution. Now over here, let's say we have some variance for this particular distribution. What exactly it means? It means that wherever the mean comes of this particular distribution. Now let's say for this particular distribution, we have a mean point. That is this particular point. Let's say this is the mean point. Now variance is that how much spread is followed for this particular distribution from the mean point. How much the extreme values are actually spread from the mean. Generally, if we look at this particular distribution, if this is the mean point and this is the distribution, then in that particular case, here there is high variance because you can see the spread is more from the mean. The data set distribution spread is more from the mean. And generally this type of distribution or data set is considered to be not so good because whenever we use machine learning or deep learning techniques on it, due to high variance, the model that will be created might overfit or it might not give you the best results. Because whenever we talk about high variance, it says that the data variety is very high. We get more number of new points. It says that the data contains more number of unique points, more number of different variety of points. It is not that good for the model. Now to avoid more variance, we have multiple techniques in machine learning. We'll talk about it as and when it comes in the flow. So I hope to some extent variance is clear to you. Do you want to check out this attractive funny means? Then what are you waiting for? These are just a glimpse of the memes that I've created on my Instagram page. You can find the link to my Instagram handle in the description box. Please visit the link and do watch all these interesting funny memes. These are not just memes. These memes and reels contain technical information. Here I try to relate memes with the technological concepts. So please do appreciate that by watching all those. And if you love it, please hit the follow button. Now let's move on to the next measure of spread that is standard deviation. So let's have a look at first the definition of standard deviation. Here you can see that standard deviation is nothing but the square root of variance. So you just have to remember what all things we have learned in variance. That same thing comes here. But just the thing is that standard deviation is the square root of variance value. Now let's see what exactly standard deviation is used for. You can see that standard deviation tells you how much the data values deviates or vary from the mean position. Now, if you look at this particular statement, till here, it is exactly same as that of variance. But after this, you can see that it has the same unit as that of the data values. Now, if you carefully observe over here, when we talked about variance, it had totally different unit from the data values unit. But here, when we talk about standard deviation, it has the same unit as that of the data values. For example, if the data values unit is in meters, then the standard deviation value unit will also be in meters. It won't have any other unit. And because of this particular thing, since it has the same unit as that of the data values unit, we prefer standard deviation. Standard deviation is always going to make the task easy because it has the same unit. Now, let's have a look at the formula for it. Standard deviation formula is nothing but square root of the variance value. Now we already know how to calculate variance. So we can simply get it by taking the summation of all the data points. Now here I'm talking about population i equals to 1 to capital N. Here we have to take the subtraction of each and every data value by the mean of the entire data values. The whole square and in the denominator comes the capital N value. Now this was for population. I hope you will do it for the sample. Now quickly let's have a look at a simple example. Here we will take the same example of population that contains the data points 5, 8, 10, 12, 15. We have to calculate standard deviation now. Now if you remember the formula of standard deviation is nothing but square root of variance. Now in the previous slides we already have calculated the variance of this particular population and it came out to be 11.6. Now in this particular slide, I'm just going to take the square root of this. Now it is nothing but 3.4058. So this is nothing but the standard deviation for this particular data values or population. So I hope this thing is clear. Now graphically, if we talk about, if we take this particular distribution 
from the mean position same as that of the variance the standard deviation also checks the spread of the entire distribution or the data values higher standard deviation is not good same as that of the conditions in variance higher standard deviation is not generally considered to be good we always prefer a balanced or low standard deviation so i hope this particular standard deviation measure of spread is clear to you all now let's have a look at this particular measure of spread that is quartiles so what are they the quartiles have the values that divides the data set into four equal parts or quarters in quartiles there are some important parameters we are going to look into it one by one the first is the first quartile or we can call it as q1 so what exactly it is it is the median of the lower half of the data set now let's see we have the data set distribution something like this now when we talk about the lower half it is nothing but the left part where the lower values are present so this particular part is called as lower half so what exactly is q1 q1 is the median of this lower half now median we already have talked about median what exactly it is it is nothing but the middle value present in the entire range of data so this is nothing but q1 similarly we have q2 that is the second quartile q2 is the median of the whole data set now over here you can see the entire data set already is partitioned into two lower half and the other half so the middle value that comes in this particular entire data set is termed as q2 so this particular value will be q2 similarly we have the third quartile that is q3 q3 is the median of the upper half of the data set similar to the lower half now there is the upper half we can have the median of the upper half and let's term it as q3 so that is what is this q3 now what exactly this quartile tells the quartiles tells how the data values are distributed or spread across the data set now over here in this particular data set you can see more number of values are present in this particular range you can see from q1 to q3 maximum number of data points are present and that is what term as interquartile range interquartile range is that range where maximum number of data points are present so these quartiles are generally used to find out the interquartile range that is termed as iqr which is calculated with q3 minus q1 now there is a speciality for the points present inside this particular interquartile range and it is that it is less affected by outliers or extreme values than the range that means if we if we look at the entire range of the data set it starts from here we call it min and here we call it max so if we compare it with the entire range the interquartile range data values whatever they are present in this particular range they will be less affected by the outliers or the data points that behaves abnormally but when we talk about this particular section data points they will always be more affected whenever they, we are talking about outliers whenever an outlier comes it will always be affected more than the data points present inside the interquartile range so i hope this thing is clear see a simple example of quartiles here we have the same population that contains the data points 5 8 10 12 and 15 we have to calculate the quartiles that is q1 q2 q3 and we also have to calculate the iqr so we already know that q1 is nothing but the median of lower half q2 is nothing but the median of the entire data set q3 is nothing but the median of the upper half of the data set and iqr is nothing but q3 minus q1 we have the formula for it first we have to calculate this three now whenever we have to find out the quartiles we just have to first make sure that the data set is sorted in ascending order now over here in this particular case we have total five data points now in this five data points we can simply calculate the median of the entire data set first it will always be a good practice to calculate the median of the entire data set first so that you will get the separation the lower half and the upper half so over here we have since odd number of data points we can simply consider the middle value as median so over here you can say that q2 is 10 simply it is 10 if you don't know how to calculate the median then you can see the video of measure of central tendency that is present in this particular applied data science playlist 
I will recommend you to watch that first and then come to this particular topic. Now, since we have got this particular median, we now have the lower half and the upper half of the entire data set. So, this is what is the lower half. From this, we can get Q1 and this is what is the upper half. From this, we can get Q3. Now, over here, you can see that there are only two data points which is even in number. So, for calculating the median of these two data points, we'll have to take the average of these. So, we can simply calculate the average 5 plus 8 divided by 2. 5 plus 8 is 13. 13 divided by 2 is nothing but 6.5. So, we got Q1 as 6.5. Similarly, for the upper half, we have again even data points. So, 12 plus 15. We have to write 12 plus 15 divided by 2. So, we get it's something like 27 divided by 2, which is nothing but 13.5. So, let's write Q3 value as 13.5. Now, we have Q1 and we have Q3. We can calculate the interquartile range, which is Q3 minus Q1, which is nothing but 13.5 minus 6.5. So, we can simply calculate and get the value 7 as interquartile range. So, I hope this thing is clear to you all. So, I hope this particular numerical is clear to you all. It is very important to calculate quartiles and interquartile range to understand the distribution or the spread of the data points present inside the data set. So, I hope this is clear. Now, graphically, let's have a look at this particular distribution to understand quartiles. So, if we take this particular distribution, we, we will be having the minimum as the extreme value and maximum as the extreme value of this particular data set. Now, we will be having a median for this particular data set. Let's say the median for this particular data set is this particular point. Now, whenever we calculate the median of the entire data set, it is termed as Q2. Remember this. Now, by this median, we have got the lower half and upper half of the data set. This is the lower half and this is the upper half of the data set. Whenever we calculate the median of the lower half, we call the median of this particular lower half as Q1. That is the first quartile. And similarly, we have got the upper half. So, the median when we calculate it, it comes out to be Q3. That is the third quartile of the entire distribution. Now, in this particular distribution, if we extend the median value of the entire data set, we get it something like this. Similarly, if we talk about the Q1 also and the Q3 also, if we extend it towards the y-axis, we get this particular partition. Now, it is always said that this particular range where it comes from Q1 till Q3 is called as interquartile range. And in this particular interquartile range, we have most of the data. Most of the data will be located in this particular interquartile range from the entire data set. And the speciality of it is that any data point in this particular interquartile range will be always less affected by outliers. So, whenever we consider outliers, it will be less affected by outliers and when we talk about the data set which is not present inside the interquartile range, those data points will always be highly affected whenever any outlier comes. For example, these data points. And this particular quartiles mechanism is always used to plot one of the famous plot called as box plot. Through this box plot, we can understand the distribution in detail as well as we can understand the outliers too. We can come to know wherever the outliers are present and we can simply use this box plot to remove it. Now we'll understand box plot in detail and we'll also code for it. For now, I hope all the measures of spread is clear to you all. I have tried my best to make you understand all the different measures of spread in detail with examples. I hope everything is clear. If you guys have any single doubt, then you can straight away put it in the comment section. I'll be happy to solve it. For more such videos, do like, share and subscribe to my channel. Also hit the bell icon and don't forget to follow me on Instagram. Please join me on Telegram. Thanks for watching. Have a good day ahead. And stay tuned for the upcoming videos.